Testing one, two. Testing one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Testing one, two. You set this one. Testing. <coughs> one, two, test, one, two. Testing one, two. Jesus, let your kingdom come here. Let your will be done here in us. Jesus, there is no one greater. You alone are Savior. Show the world your King of heaven, come down. King of heaven, come now. Let your glory reign, shine it like the day. King of heaven, come. King of heaven, rise up. Who can stand against us? You are strong to say in your mighty name. King of heaven, come. of your mercy rescue for your glory we cry Jesus set our hearts towards you that every eye would see you lifted high King of heaven come down King of heaven come now let your glory reign Shine it like the day, King of heaven, come. King of heaven, rise up. Who can stand against us? You are strong to say in your mighty name, King of heaven, come. Whoa. us today give thanks to the Lord our God and King his love endures forever for he is good he is above all things his love endures forever sing praise sing praise with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm his love endures forever for the life that's been reborn. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong. Forever God is with us forever, forever. From the rising to the setting sun, His love endures forever. 
by the grace of God we will carry on His love endures forever Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise Forever God is faithful Forever God is strong Forever God is with us forever 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 God is faithful forever God is strong forever God is with us forever Thanks be to God. He is with us forever. He'll never leave us, never forsake us. I'm so glad to see each of you here today. Just want to invite you to enter in, sing with all your hearts as we sing this song, The Goodness of God Again. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing. Of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing. Of the goodness of God I love your voice You led me through the fire In darkest night You are close like no other I've known you as a father Known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God and all my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, running after me. Your goodness is running after, running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, running after me and all my life you have been faithful yes lord all my life you have been so so good with every breath that i am able i will sing of the goodness of God Yes, I will sing Of the goodness of God Amen Good morning, Fellowship Covenant Church. How are you doing today? It's great to see everyone here. And uh, I know it's a little cold. It looks like uh, everyone was able to uh, survive the snowstorm this week. And we had some major trees come down. I don't know if anyone else had some big trees, but some of the roads in our neighborhood were actually blocked 
by uh, some of the trees that came down. It was pretty crazy, but uh, it didn't seem like it was a whole lot, uh, except for that it was super wet, and so uh, that seemed like it made a big difference. But uh, it's great to see you all here and to be together today and to worship together today. And uh, if your neighbor's not wearing green, this is your permission to pinch them today. It is St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> um, and uh, we, uh, we get to, it's, I love St. Patrick's Day. This is just, uh, I, I love everything about St. Patrick's Day. When I lived in Chicago, I always would go and watch the, the dying of the Chicago River, which just seemed like the, the funniest thing that a bunch of climate activists were pouring a bunch of dye into a river. Um, and I know they say that it's all nice and dandy, but if you've ever seen that river, that thing radiates with green after they do that. But uh, anyways, uh, it was one of my favorite things, and there was always a great parade and all that stuff. Uh, today, uh, maybe you're celebrating and uh, just uh, excited to, to be able to remember that. We're actually going to talk a little bit about St. Patrick's today uh, in, our, in our sermon, but uh, uh, I want to just uh, give us a few uh, updates and uh, announcements before that and before we get started with our sermon for today and uh, continue worshiping God. Um, we have a few different things that are coming up. The first is that this Wednesday night was supposed to be our Narnia night, uh, and the Narnia night uh, movie night unfortunately has to be canceled. Uh, the Koi's have come down with a, an illness that they're dealing with, and uh, it supposedly has a 10, it's not COVID, it's like a 10-day quarantine or something. I don't know. I have no idea. Anyway, so they're kind of out of pocket for a little bit right now, and they were the ones who were kind of really putting on a lot of the, the stuff and, and making that a, an opportunity that we could, we could join in. And so that's going to be either rescheduled for a later date, or it might be po- just postponed until next year. We'll see you. I'm not sure exactly what the plans are going forward, but... Um, anyway, so with that, um, this Wednesday, no Narnia night, unfortunately. We have to cancel that. The goal was to have that during spring break, and we won't be able to have that this week. Um, I'm getting feedback. Uh, so uh, the other things uh, that are uh, coming up, uh, we have uh, Palm Sunday next Sunday. We have uh, Good Friday service at 6 o'clock here at the church. If you don't have plans for Good Friday, come and join us here at the church at 6 p.m. here, and uh, we will celebrate and remember Good Friday, uh, the Lord's death, and what he did for us on the cross. And, and that's a service that we get to gather, and we get to remember why he did what he did, and the, the sacrifice and the immense cost that it cost him for him to do that for us, and uh, just the, in, the incredible gift that he gave us on the cross. And so Good Friday, uh, that's going to be uh, the, the last Friday of the month. The, the last Sunday of the month is going to be Easter, and so uh, we have our Easter breakfast at 9.15. Uh, if you want to bring food for that, you can sign up out in the lobby, talk to Cheryl about that as well, and uh, make sure that you include your phone number if you're going to sign up on the sheet out there so that she can actually get a hold of you. Um, and uh, uh, you can join us for that. It's going to be great. It's open to everyone, even if you don't bring food. So it's going to be a fantastic time. And there's some incredible cooks in our congregation that are going to be making some good stuff. So join us for that, 915. 945, we have an Easter egg hunt for children through high school. Uh, it's going to be, you know, every, every, every kid's age. So uh, whether it's toddlers and, and infants even sometimes, uh, all the way up to high school or students, um, we will have egg hunt for, uh, for all those ages come and join us for that. If you want to donate candy for that, um, I know that uh, Jackie and the, um, the, the children's ministry crew downstairs that so incredibly faithfully serve every single week and really try to do their best in serving uh, just uh, our students and our children, um, that uh, they would appreciate some of those donations to make it a really fun time for, for our students and for our children. So uh, if you want to donate for that, uh, you can bring some candy. Uh, they have some different things. The only thing we usually say is just no peanuts, because that's the, the main thing that we'll get in trouble for if, uh, if something really bad happens. So um, no peanuts, um, no nuts in general is a good policy <laughs> for, for donated candy. Um, and uh, with that, uh, let's, uh, let's just pray and give this morning to God, if you'd pray with me. Father, uh, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you that we can gather together. Lord, we can have a, a warm sanctuary that we can come together and we can, we can worship you. Lord, we can, uh, we can sing your praise. Lord, we can hear from your word. And I pray today that our hearts would be open to what you have to speak to us. Lord, that your word would be spoken and preached. And Lord, that, that it would enter our hearts and minds. It would renew us. It would, it would prepare us for this week. It would prepare us for the mission that you have us on in our life, God. And Lord, that we would go boldly from this place with that 
Father, we love you. We thank you for all you've done for us. We thank you for the season that we get to celebrate what you've done for us and coming to earth and dying on the cross for us. Lord, we love you. We pray that we would be bold in our message. We ask this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Out of the wilderness Into your deliverance Look where I'm standing now These hands that once were chained Now lifted high in praise Look where I'm standing now Look where I'm standing now I stand on Chain breaking, miracle making, powerful name of Jesus. On the body raising, prodigal saving, powerful name of Jesus. Led by your mighty hand. Into the promised land Look where I'm standing now You carried the cross for me Now I'm a child of the King Look where I'm standing now Look where I'm standing now I stand on the chain breaking Miracle making Powerful name of Jesus on the body raised, prodigal saved. Powerful name of Jesus. Hallelujah, I'm free. Hallelujah, I'm free. Jesus, my Savior, rescued me. Hallelujah, I'm free. Hallelujah, I'm free. Jesus, my Savior, rescued me. Hallelujah, I'm free. I stand on the chain breaking, miracle making, powerful name of Jesus. On the body raising, prodigal saving, powerful name of Jesus. Hallelujah, I'm free. Hallelujah, I'm free. Jesus, my Savior, rescued me. Hallelujah, I'm free. Hallelujah, I'm free. Hallelujah, I'm free. Uh, one of the things I get to announce today, too, is uh, that uh, you'll look in the pew in front of you, and uh, we still have a, a number more because we, uh, we're wanting to put more than one in just every uh, pew box, but uh, we had six different Bibles in the backs of the pews in the room, and none of them matched what we were using on the screen. We used the English Standard Version, and uh, we had uh, one of our members of the church uh, just really decided to bless uh, our church and our congregation with uh, new Bibles. And so we have in the backs of the pews new Bibles. So amen to that. Thank you for uh, the person who uh, bought those and donated those for the church. Um, that's just an incredible blessing for us um, to be able to actually say if you want to open your Bibles today and uh, to page 1175 uh, <laughs> and actually know that you're all going to end up at the same place. Um, and uh, beforehand, I could say a number, and uh, a third of you or maybe a fourth of you <laughs> would not be on the same page. And so, um, or I should say only a third or a fourth of you would be on the same page. Uh, so anyway, um, really excited about that, and uh, uh, that's just a, a big blessing. You know, the Word of God is so important for us to be able to read and to study and to make part of our life. 
It is a communication from God to us. And sometimes we, we love to pray, but we don't love to read. And, and other times we love to read, but we don't love to pray. And, and the reality is that both of those are part of the conversation that we have with God and Him speaking to us and, and speaking His Word to us and, and, and filling us with His knowledge. And, uh, you know, as we look at history, you know, there's been a lot of things that have happened throughout history. And, uh, I've, you know, I've been watching all these different videos about how we've only had the written language for 6,000 years at most. We've only been able to, like, human history has only had written language for 6,000 years, right? And, and that started with early Sumerian cuneiform. That's the earliest writing that we have so far. And uh, we have uh, a number of different things throughout history that have been lost, uh, we have lots of different texts and lots of different writings and different things that have been lost to history. And uh, we, we know about it because other things mention it. In the Bible, for instance, there's a number of books that are mentioned that, uh, that are referenced in the Bible that we do not have copies of. We have forgeries of them. We have the, early, like, the earliest example of some of these, like the book of Jasher, where we talked about with the book of Joshua. It mentions the book of Jasher. The earliest copy of that that we have is from like 500 or 600 AD, I think. And uh, it's clearly like a, a person saw that the book of Jasher wasn't in the, like we didn't have a copy, so they went and wrote their own copy um, to try and put into the Bible what they uh, wanted to put into the Bible. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that happens quite a bit. And, uh, and so uh, the reality is that this book is incredible because it has been so faithfully preserved throughout its entire history. It's incredible what's in this book and how well preserved this book is, better than any other historical document in history. And uh, today is also, I mentioned this earlier, today is also a very fun day. It's St. Patrick's Day, and I want to open us up by asking this question to you. Who would you credit the, the three people, let's, let's give you three people, who, and maybe you don't have three people, maybe you have way more than three people, but I want you to try and figure out who would you credit three people that have most impacted your life for Jesus Christ? Who impacted your life the most in giving you the knowledge and understanding and helping to impart the relationship we have with Jesus Christ, our Savior? Who would those three people be? Some of us, we might say Billy Graham, uh, he was a major evangelist, and many of us, I don't know, just a show of hands, how many of you have been to a uh, Billy Graham crusade in your life? There's a few of you in the room, yeah. Uh, I've never gotten to go to a Billy Graham crusade. I got to go to a Franklin Graham crusade. Billy Graham was still alive at the time, but I got to meet his son and pray with his son at the Rock the Range event that came to Colorado uh, back in, what was it, 2011 or something like that, and I got to meet with Franklin Graham. That was pretty incredible, but I got to be honest, he's not probably the one that's impacted my life the most. Uh, some people might say a, 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 major, uh, a major author, a Christian author or something that has impacted their life. Um, some people might say Jesus Christ himself um, and just, you know, uh, saying that, uh, you know, well, of course, uh, that, that one should be a, a shoe in So outside of Jesus Christ and his impact on your life, who is it? For me, I have to start and say my mom and my dad. My mom and my dad are people who I look to and I remember the impact that they've had on my life. Every morning when I would get up, I was the early riser in our family in elementary and, and junior high and high school. And I would get up and I would, the reason I got up early was because I wanted to watch morning cartoons before my parents got up before my brothers were competing for the remote with me, okay? And so I would get up, and I would go downstairs, and at 6 o'clock, I would always hear my dad get up. And my dad would come downstairs, and he would start reading his Bible. 6 a.m., that, that meant that I was getting up at 5 a.m. That's a little more difficult these days unless the kid wakes me up. But, but you know, I, I would get up early, and, and my dad would be there regularly reading his Bible, for an hour. And I remember that uh, I would, you know, when I was home into the day and, and my mom would be getting up and she would have that moment in the morning, I'd walk into my parents' room. That's where I'd most often find her. She'd still be in bed, 
but she would have her Bible and her notes and whatever study she was going through and highlighters and, and note cards and all this different stuff laid out in front of her, and she'd be reading her Bible, and she'd be crying sometimes and, and praying, and, and I'd say, Mom, are you okay? I'd see her crying. She's like, I'm just praying. I'm just praying about all the different things that, that are going on, and I'm praying for you guys. And you know, I learned later that, you know, some of the things that she would pray for consistently, she prayed for me to have a, and my brothers to, to find godly wives. That prayer got answered in incredible fashion. All of us uh, brothers really uh, found incredible women. She prayed for the different things that were going on in our lives, for the things that were going on at school for us, things that were going on at church for my dad, uh, things that just everything you could think of, she'd be in there praying and reading the Word of God. And I saw that growing up. I got to see that impact of, of them and their relationship with God and how much that meant to them and the influence that had on them. The other than that, it was really hard. I, I don't know how to do three, actually. I, I, so I had to tie it and just make them into one. My grandma and my grandpa on my mom's side were, were probably the next biggest impact. My grandpa was such an incredible man of God. While he lived, and my grandma, she's in the hospital right now, but she was a faithful woman of God. And that's the reason, but because of my grandma and my grandpa, my mom knows Jesus Christ. And because of my mom, my dad knows Jesus Christ. Because my dad was not a believer before he met my mom. And so it's because of that chain of history, I get to stand here today and as one of you, praise God as one of his children. And, uh, you know, we, we just wrapped up 1 Thessalonians, and we're going to be getting into 2 Thessalonians next. And I like to jump between the Old Testament and the New Testament usually, but because these two books were written to the same people, and they were written in fairly close proximity, and they have similar topics, and 2 Thessalonians builds on 1 Thessalonians, I wanted to jump into that. And we're not going to cover a whole lot of it today, we're just going to cover the start. Because the start is a perfect match with what today is, St. Patrick's Day. I, uh, I'm, I, uh, my last name, if you don't know, is McCreevy. If you're watching online, my last name is McCreevy, M-C-R, capital R, okay? And uh, it's actually Irish. For most of my life, my grandparents thought it was Scottish until my mom went gung-ho on Ancestry.com and found out that it's actually an Irish surname, and uh, at that point, we knew we had Irish in us. We knew we had Scottish in us, and we knew we had Norwegian in us. We didn't have really anything else in us. But we realized that we thought the name McCreevy was Scottish, and in fact, it was Irish. And that was a big shock to my grandparents on my dad's side. And uh, I, I think back to the history, and I look at our ancestry and, and kind of the, the history that exists there, and there's a good probability without some of the work and effect of, of St. Patrick that my family might not have been Christians. I, I, on my mom's side, they are generational Christians for many generations. Many generations, which is incredible. And, and I don't know a whole lot of people who can actually say that for generations they've had in their family relationships with Jesus Christ. My, my uh, dad's side, there are generational Christians as well. My great-grandma was a Christian, and she prayed for my dad regularly, and she actually wrote a note to my dad before she died that my dad never got. And uh, my, my, this note was basically praying for him that he would come to know Christ as his Savior. And this was before he came to know Jesus. He got this years later, and my grandma gave this letter to him that my great-grandma had been praying for his salvation when he was just a little kid. Incredible. And, uh, you know, as we think about the, the people who've impacted our lives, the people who've gone before us, the people who maybe they haven't gone very far before us, maybe they're still alive. My parents are still alive. My grandma is still alive. But the history that exists of, of people introducing us to the love and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross is incredible. The history that we can look at and see, even within the walls of this church, how many people have gone before us to make this place a possibility for us today to worship in and to praise his name we have a huge Bible in the front lawn. I love that Bible. We have a huge Bible in the front lawn that 
declares boldly in a, in a world that hates the Bible that we are about the Bible, that we are about the Word of God. Let's read these first, uh, first four verses here. The title for today is Celebrating Faithfulness. The title for today is Celebrating Faithfulness. And we're going to read the first four verses of 2 Thessalonians, and we're going to talk about what Paul says in these first four verses. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. The Thessalonian church, as we know, have been, from the very start when Paul was there, he was run out of town. And we know that they have been dealing with immense persecution from day one. And some of us might feel a little bit of persecution, but the reality is that most of us really aren't feeling a whole lot of persecution these days. So that might be a little bit hard for us to relate to. We might feel some social pressures not to be Christian, but let's be honest. No one's beating us. No one's stoning us. No one's trying to kill us generally. You know, it's, it's, we have it pretty good compared to the Thessalonian church. We haven't lost any members that I know of due to persecution of, of someone saying, this, you're a Christian, I'm going to kill you. That hasn't happened. And as we look at this today, Paul starts out 2 Thessalonians remembering and celebrating the Thessalonian believers. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, as is right because your faith is growing abundantly and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. We boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in all the afflictions that you are enduring. Today is the day we celebrate St. Patrick. Why do we celebrate St. Patrick? Anyone? Why? Why? Drove the snakes away. Okay. Yeah, that's one of the, one of the, the, the legends of St. Patrick is he drove snakes away. What, you know, why else do we celebrate this guy? Is it just a good opportunity for us to drink? Being in Chicago, I also got to see how many people were, were drunk on St. Patrick's Day. And uh, it's a little sad because I'm not against alcohol. I don't think that it's unbiblical to have a drink now and then or anything like that. But the reality is, is that this has been turned into a, a, a lush uh, holiday of just total inebriation. And if you've ever been in Chicago at the Chicago Parade, it might be entertaining, but it is certainly not about St. Patrick's faith. St. Patrick is an incredible person in history in the faith that we have. He is incredible in what he did and, and when he went before us and, and the work that he did as an evangelist and missionary in Ireland. That is why he is celebrated. That is why he's remembered is because of the work that he did in Ireland. And we might not know the, the history of, of what he did and, and we might not know the, the exact history of the Thessalonians, but the reality is, is that as believers, we have a number of people we should intentionally remember and praise God for that have gone before us to bring us to more knowledge and more understanding of him, to impart the faith to another generation. Today we're talking about St. Patrick and some lessons that we can learn from St. Patrick. We're talking about celebrating faithfulness in those around us. We remember St. Patrick today because of the work that he was done. And if you don't know this, St. Patrick was in Britain. He was born in Britain and uh, he was captured by a raiding party 
at the age of 16. He was taken into slavery at the age of 16, and at the time, he did not believe in Jesus Christ. He knew about Jesus Christ. He had grown up in a culture that, that understood who Jesus Christ was, and so he was educated in Christianity, but he wasn't highly educated in Christianity yet. He was just a person that knew about it, but had never made a personal profession of faith. And he lived sometime between 400 and 500 AD. Okay, so he's a fifth century Christian. And his life is incredible in what he did and what he accomplished. He, he was 16 years old when he was taken into slavery. And at that time, there was rampant paganism, and there was rampant idol worship, and there was human sacrifice even in Ireland. And the government of Ireland, it was not as savage as you might be led to believe by a lot of Hollywood and other sources. The government was actually pretty solid in Ireland. There was a king, and then there were, uh, there were you know, uh, governors of, of different counties, and then they had chieftains underneath them, and they all paid tribute to the king, and it kind of worked its way up. And as, a res- as some of the laws uh, that existed, one of, one of those laws that existed was that in certain circumstances, you had to have foreign-born people who were sacrificed or who were given as slaves in certain circumstances. And so they would do these raiding parties so that they could fulfill the law of their country by taking people from Britain and other areas and bringing them back to Ireland. And they would, in some situations, as in St. Patrick's situation, they would be given into slavery. And he was made to be a shepherd at 16 years old. He was taken in captivity and he was given to a chieftain and he was made to be a shepherd. And... uh, I don't know about you, but at 16 years old, I was playing a lot of video games, and I was not doing very many things that were productive at that time. I was working a job, but I wasn't like the best employee. I was not a bad employee, but this is a boy who was captured at the age of 16, not a Christian, taken into captivity. And while he was in captivity, it was about six years, I believe, that he was in captivity, he came to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He remembered the things that he grew up with. He remembered the teaching that he had heard growing up, and he knew that there was one true God, and he was surrounded by this pagan worship in their culture in Ireland. And one day he was praying, and he felt God give him a vision that he should leave, that he should flee, that he should escape his slavery. And so he sees this vision of God saying, go to this town that you've never been to and go board this boat that you don't even know is there because I'm telling you to. And St. Patrick says, okay. He flees and he approaches this, this boat and he, uh, he gets to this town that he's never been to and he, he finds a boat and he tries to board this boat and the captain says, no, absolutely not. I'm not taking you back to Britain. And he says, you know, he, he starts to leave and as he leaves, he, he prays. And as he prays that God would open the hearts of the captain and the crew he hears one of the crew members call out to him and say, wait, 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 we'll take you. St. Patrick, he made it back to Britain. He eventually got educated in the the scriptures. He was taken in as a, 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 basically a a growing believer. Uh, They didn't have all of the, the monasteries and everything at that time. They just had some basic education through the local churches. And so he was taken under the wing of of one of the local uh, bishops, and he is educated in the scriptures, and he devotes his life to learning about God. And in the process of doing that, he hears God give him a vision and speak to him that the people of Ireland are crying out. The people of Ireland are crying out that they need someone to go back to them. Now, I could say this story, and I could, I could flip the name to a number of different people. I could say uh, DeShazer, and DeShazer was another missionary who was to the Japanese. This is the same exact story as, as I think, Jacob DeShazer. I think Jacob's his first name. Um, 
and uh, that, that he was captured in, in what was it, World War II, and he was taken, and then he went back to be a missionary afterwards uh, to the people that he was captured by. This is, I mean, again and again in history, we hear the same thing where people who were captured and taken into captivity were eventually called back to the people who took them captive to share the love of Jesus Christ. And what I think is important for us to look at with St. Patrick today is that when he discovered his relationship with Jesus Christ, when he realized what God had done for him and the preservation that God had over him in his life, he gave everything to God. And when God said, go, he said, I will. St. Patrick's entire life became dedicated to serving the triune God, Jesus Christ. If you've ever been to Ireland or or you've ever, maybe you've seen the pictures, you see these big rocks that are uh, in different areas. You've you've heard of these standing rocks, they call them. Uh, The the name is the Dallins. for, or, or Gallans. I'm not, I don't speak the, the language very well. And, and so a G-A-L-L-A-N-S is the proper term for these stone structures that stand up, and they were pagan idols. And the people would worship these standing stones. There's a picture that is on the title slide that, that is of one of these standing stones. They had these all over, these standing stones. And, and, and what St. Patrick knew about this country was that it needed the gospel and that they struggled heavily with idolatry. As I thought about the, the relation to our, our current culture and, and what goes on, in, in, this, in Irish culture at this time and in Ireland, the, the people of Ireland who worshiped the pagan gods, they would sacrifice humans to these. They would sacrifice the first, the, every firstborn of every kind of animal. The firstborn animal would always be sacrificed. The other thing that would be sacrificed was the, the, the firstborn of their sons. Okay, so if, a, if your son had a, a child, the firstborn son would be sacrificed to these, uh, to these idols in, in, in this pagan religion. There was a human sacrifice, and, and they worshipped these stones. And, and one of the stones in particular uh, in this place called Moislat, which Moislat is literally the plain of slaughter, there was a circle of stones, and in the center of the circle of stones, there were 12 stones, and in the center of the circle of stones was a golden stone or a golden head that was to symbolize uh, basically the, the, the lead deity of, of this pagan religion, Krom Kruok. And Krom Kruok, he is later in, in what we see in written history he actually is equated with Baal, the god of Baal. Uh, if you remember from the Old Testament, Elijah, when he goes head to head with the, the priests of Baal, he, uh, he ha- builds an altar and he douses it with water and uh, he builds it out of wood and he's the only one there and he gets down and he prays that God would engulf his altar and the priests of Baal, they build their altar and they're slashing themselves and cutting themselves and dancing around their altar and their, wa- their altar doesn't have water on it or anything. And Elijah prays, and from heaven, a a pillar of fire, a fireball, engulfs his altar and lights his altar on fire, showing that the one true God was the God that Elijah worshipped. That's that's another story about Baal, the God of Baal, uh, the God Baal, little g, not big g. Baal was a fertility god. He was also a sun god which is really common in pagan religions. And, and Druidism was a very common thing at this time, and they worshiped different elements and fertility and things like that. And so that was a part of who this Krum Kruok was. It was another name for the same characteristics that we find about Baal. So you can imagine St. Patrick coming into contact with this, what he knows to be a false god, and the worship and the sacrifice and the evil that's being done in the name of this false god, and he's abhorred by it. And today, as I look around, there's so many different things we worship. I was thinking about, what do we sacrifice to today? What are we sacrificing to today? And certainly a part of what we're sacrificing to today is is sexuality in our culture. 
I mean, if you, if, you know, I, I will speak against this boldly. I have no problem speaking against abortion because abortion, I think, is child sacrifice to the God of sex in our culture. It is a, a sexual freedom that people seek, and so as a result, they are seeking through abortion to free themselves from the consequences that are natural for having sex. We see that there is, there is constant attack in our culture against Christianity. We also see that, that in our culture we have certain things we give money to, that we, we support, that, that, we, that we put on uh, esteem. I think one of the, the craziest pictures that I've seen in the last four years was when uh, I, I saw our politicians bowing before a room of, of people of color. And it wasn't that people of color were bad. It was that we were bowing in worship. Our politicians were bowing in worship to these people strictly based on their color. It was incredible. I've never seen that in my lifetime. And that's just one example. It's a small example. But we give to politicians money. And, and I mean, it's incredible the amount of money that goes to politicians these days. We, we worship our politicians. Both sides of the aisle worship their politicians. It's incredible to me how much hope and how much joy and how much anger we can have evoked from us based on these politicians who are just people like you and I. And they're not good people. I don't care which one you name. They're not good people. I got into a debate with my brother-in-law about some of the politicians. And he's like, well, you know, these, these people are just all bad and this stuff. And I said, well, yeah, but these people, are, you're, you're saying this, you, you are claiming this side. And yet these people in your party are doing the exact same things that you're accusing the other side of. So why aren't you finding a different solution rather than using a, a straw man argument, a one-sided argument against the other side that your side's guilty of. It's incredible. We have idol worship in our culture today. We have TV shows that, that we spend more time with. We have video games that we spend more time with. I bring up video games. I know that we're an older congregation, but it is a very common thing for younger people that we spend time with more time than we spend with God. We spend more time with food. This is one that I struggle with. We spend more time with food than we do with God sometimes. We spend more time with the textbooks, which are the, the biblical literature of our day, that, that oftentimes you look back at so many of the things that are written in textbooks, they are wrong. They're just downright written. You know, history is written by the victors so often. And we worship textbooks. We worship so many different things. We have idolatry in our culture. And what I love is the example that St. Patrick gave us of pointing to Christ. In everything that he did, he pointed to Christ. Everything that he found when he was going through Ireland, he made sure to point to Christ. When he was in, uh, when he was in Ireland and he returned to do his missionary journey, his missionary time in Ireland, one of the things that he found was that uh, at, at one point, he knew Easter was coming up. We're two weeks away from Easter. And I love Easter. I love the colors, and I love the excitement and the, the change of seasons that it kind of marks. And, and Easter was coming up, and, and you can imagine that in a Druidic uh, pagan religion, in, a, uh, uh, in the, the pagan religion of Ireland, that that, that time of year was a, a major year, and they celebrated the king's nativity at this time. And so St. Patrick, during this time, went and decided, you know what, they're going to have a celebration, they're going to have a feast, they're going to have this massive thing going on, this massive party. I'm going to go and celebrate Easter and Jesus' resurrection. It's, it was the same day that Easter happened that the, uh, the Irish would celebrate this king's nativity, the same exact day. And so he decided to go publicly boldly celebrate Easter in the face of the king's nativity. 
And so he went on the eve of Easter and he uh, went to the, uh, to the town of Tara and he lit a bonfire on the eve of Easter. And if you know anything about bonfires in, in, uh, in Ireland, they, they mark a pagan ritual in Ireland. They're, and so he lights a bonfire on the eve of Easter, which was actually breaking the law. And he gets arrested for lighting this fire to celebrate Easter. And uh, he loved to take things that were pagan and put a big old Jesus stamp on them. And so these, these, these uh, dolans that were all over, the standing rocks that were all over, he would carve crosses into them so that when people went to worship these things, they would see and remember that Jesus Christ died for them. So he goes to the, the capital city of the kingdom in Ireland and gets arrested and brought before the king uh, Loger. And King Loger listens to him and his message. And, and what does St. Patrick do? He seizes the opportunity with all of the kings and all of the nobles and all of the, the royalty that exists to preach the gospel to them. And in preaching the gospel directly to the royalty that existed there, in a, in a, in a situation where he would have likely been killed, he actually led many of the people in that court to Jesus Christ. The king did not become a Christian, but the king let him go, which was also a major victory for him because he thought he was going to get killed. He preached boldly and he preached passionately. That's the example that we have throughout history of those who've gone before us, great men and women of faith that shared about the one true God. Patrick modeled a life of prayer. We already talked about how he prayed, and, and while he was a shepherd, he would pray, and he saw the vision. He prayed when he went to the boat, and he was rejected by the captain of the boat. He prayed. He lived a life of prayer that was modeled through prayer. He was constantly, in, in, in prayer, he was sent back to the people of Ireland after he had escaped. And you see time and time again in his writings that prayer was a fundamental part of his life. In everything he did, he would pray. St. Patrick preached boldly. St. Patrick modeled a life of prayer. Now there's things that are said about St. Patrick that don't have a lot of basis in history. There's a lot of miracles that are attributed to him that literally have no historical evidence for them. Like the, the, the stag where he, he gets seen like a, uh, he gets seen as a flock of, of uh, or a, a group of, uh, of, of um, a deer wandering through a field as he's walking through. A lot of these different things, like uh, they were just created fables and myths. But what we do have is his confession. One thing we know that we do have from him is his confession that he wrote. It's the most uh, authoritative thing we can have that truly points to who he was and what he believed. And as he writes his confession, he wrote his confession for a particular purpose. It wasn't just to be a treatise on being a Christian. It wasn't just to be a treatise on, on you know, preaching the gospel or any of that stuff. He wrote this confession as a defense. So why did he need a defense? Because what became of, of St. Patrick's ministry, and this is so often the case with Christians, is that we tend to eat our own. We tend to eat our own. Because there's so many people who claim the name of Jesus Christ but aren't willing to live it. They don't want to be evangelists. They don't want to get out of the pew. You know why they call it a pew? Because it's got butts in it. Instead of getting out and doing something and sharing the gospel. In the same way Patrick faced immense persecution, not from the pagans, but from Christians. He wrote the confession because people who were, of, who were part of the Catholic Church at the time were reprimanding him and saying that his mission to the Irish was not ordained. It was not commissioned. 
where he had a heart to share the gospel and to preach boldly, he was told that he shouldn't have done that because it wasn't appropriate for him to do it because it hadn't been permitted by the authority structures within the Catholic Church at the time. So he wrote this confession to say why he did what he did, similar to the book of Luke and Acts, in my opinion, and how those were a history of the life of Christ and the life of the early church. We get a burden laid on us today as believers. We have a burden laid on us today. We have these incredible people who've gone before us. Your parents, if your parents are the reason that you know Jesus Christ, or your grandparents, or, or your friend are the reason that you know Jesus Christ, it's because they didn't shut up. It's because they didn't stop and hold their words back. They were bold in sharing with you and in modeling with you what the love of Christ is. The burden that gets laid on us today as believers is how do we support the work of the gospel? How do we support the work of the gospel? Are we ourselves inhibiting or adding to the work of the gospel? I want to read a few verses here. One of the first ones, uh, I believe, is... uh, Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. This is an example with with St. Patrick's life of him approaching God in prayer consistently and constantly in the midst of danger and trial and tribulation. If you want to go to the next verse. This is Galatians 5, 7 through 10. And this is speaking about a believer who had been pulled away, who had been obstructed. It says, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. He goes on to say after this that they should emasculate themselves. And he's talking about circumcision. So he's basically saying that he hopes the knife slips. A brutal passage. This is the New Testament, by the way. (laughs) This is Paul writing to the Galatian church about people who have obstructed the truth, obstructed the gospel ministry, obstructed the progress of the gospel. saddled it with, with things that, that are not necessary for us as believers. The burden laid on us is, what are we going to be? Are we going to obstruct the gospel? Or are we going to partner with the gospel? Are we going to preach boldly the gospel? We have a choice. And what are we going to choose? Hebrews 13. I love Hebrews 13. I love Hebrews. Remember, this is 13, 3, and then 7 and 8. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated since you are also are in, one, in the body. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. See, there's two types of people we can remember. We can remember the ones who are inhibiting us, or we can remember the ones who've gone before us, who are currently under trial, who are currently under tribulation, who are currently under persecution in the example that they have set in our life. We can remember those who who are being mistreated, and we can pray for them, and we can partner with them, and we can support them. You know, it's, it's incredible to me that the lack of, of love for missions work in this world. And I think the, the reason is, is because we live in this culture where it's, it is, in, in, in our current culture that is very Americanized and very American-informed, we are not bold in sharing our faith. We are not bold in sharing this book and what it says. We don't want to offend anyone. 
And as a result, we never open our mouth. We never have tough discussions. We don't carve crosses into idols. We let the idols, we help build them. We lay the foundations for them. Because we don't want to offend anyone. We don't want to live for the gospel. We don't want to be bold. The question for us today is, are we going to live for God? Are we going to live for the gospel? And are we going to support the work and the ministry that exists in our world? Or are we going to obstruct it? Are we going to get in the way of what God is doing? I love the term armchair quarterback. I have a friend who is an incredible armchair quarterback. I love watching football games. I don't really enjoy watching football all that much. I'm sorry for all the football fans in the room. I don't actually watch football very much. But with him, it's super fun because when the Broncos are losing, he gets angry. And I saw him one time take his iPod and chuck it at the TV. Thankfully, he missed the TV, but his iPad, not, not, not so good shape. <laughs> it was always entertaining to watch how angry he would get and how critical he was while he drank his Diet Pepsi with his pot belly and sat in that comfy couch. You know, we, we love to be armchair quarterbacks. We don't love to do this stuff. We don't love to share the gospel. We don't love to read God's word and to make it a part of our life. My challenge for us as a congregation today is to look at those who've gone before us, to remember them, to give thanks for them, just as the Thessalonian church gave thanks to God or that the Paul and Silvanus and Timothy gave thanks to God for the Thessalonians and for their perseverance and persecution, for their love that was increasing for each other. Paul celebrates in 2 Thessalonians, he celebrates faithfulness. Are we going to celebrate faithfulness and learn from it and become faithful ourselves? Or are we going to be critical of those who are seeking to labor for Jesus Christ? If you pray with me. Father, Lord, we thank you that we can celebrate and have a great time and eat good food. Uh, St. Patrick. Uh, this man, Patrick, that, that went before us and, and felt a burden that you gave a vision and he said yes. He said yes to the vision. He said yes to the call that you placed on his life. And he went without authority or, or without permission. He just did it. He just went and shared the gospel. And because of that, paganism died in Ireland and Christianity rose in Ireland. And your name was praised and celebrated. And many, many more from that day forward came from there and are followers of you because of his work in, in the fifth century. Just incredible. Lord, I pray that, that we would remember those in our life who, who've gone before us. Our friends, maybe our teachers or co-workers or grandparents or parents that love you, that have modeled a love for you and that were bold enough to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with us. Thank you for them, God. Lord, I pray that we would get out of the way of those who are seeking to share the gospel, who are seeking to preach your word, and we would get behind them and support them, Lord. That we would be a godly army that can stand firm in adversity and preach hope in you. Lord, we love you. I pray that you would bless our day today. We pray this in your son Jesus' name.
make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. The Lord bless you. today as we go uh, with this benediction. This is a prayer that is attributed to St. Patrick. It's called St. Patrick's Breastplate. Some of you have heard this in part before, probably not the whole thing, but I want to read this real quick to you guys. I arise today through a mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity. I should say that he is supposed to have written this when he was meeting with the king when he had been arrested and brought before the king. I arise today through a mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity, through belief in the threeness, through confession of the oneness, of the creator of creation, I arise today. Through the strength of Christ's birth with his baptism, through the strength of his crucifixion with his burial, through the strength of his resurrection with his ascension, through the strength of his descent for the judgment of doom, I arise today through the strength of the love of cherubim 
in the obedience of angels, in the service of archangels, in the hope of resurrection to meet with reward, in the prayer of patriarchs, in the predictions of prophets, in the preaching of apostles, in the faith of confessors, in the innocence of holy virgins, in the deeds of righteous men. I arise today through the strength of heaven, the light of the sun, the radiance of the moon, the splendor of fire, the speed of lightning, the swiftness of wind, the depths of the sea, the stability of the earth, the firmness of the rock. I arise today through God's strength to pilot me, God's might to uphold me, God's wisdom to guide me, God's eye to look before me, God's ear to hear me, God's word to speak for me, God's hand to guard me, God's shield to protect me. God's host to save me from snares of devils, from temptation of vices, from everyone who shall wish me ill afar and near. I summon today all these powers between me and those evils against every cruel and merciless power that may oppose my body and soul against incantations of false prophets, against false laws of heretics, against craft of idolatry, against spells of witches and smiths and wizards, against every knowledge that corrupts man's body and soul. Christ to shield me today. Against poison, against burning, against drowning, against wounding, so that there may come to me an abundance of reward. This will be familiar to, you, to many of you. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, and Christ on my left. Christ when I, die, I lie down and Christ when I sit down. Christ when I arise. Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me. Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me. Christ in every eye that sees me. Christ in every ear that hears me. I arise today through a mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity, through belief in the threeness, through confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. Father, as we go today, may we remember that it is for you and in you and through you that all things are done and that we should devote our lives to you, God. And may you make us bold. May you make us intimate with your words so that we can be bold, not in ignorance, but we can be bold in the truth and the knowledge of what you've given us in your holy word. Lord, go before us today. Help us to be bold in this season. Help us to light the bonfire that gets us arrested. Help us to, to go in faith and to feel the burden for those who don't know you and to venture out into this world and show them the love of Christ and the hope that we have through the one true God. Lord, bless us as we go this week. We pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Have a great week. Give thanks to the Lord our God and King His love endures forever For He is good, He is above all things His love endures 